Okay, uh, we'll get started. So, in the previous class, we were talking about second order systems with the transfer function given by Okay, and there were four cases, so zeta equals to zero, known as undamped system, zeta equals to in open interval zero comma one is known as damped system, zeta is equal to one is known as critically damped system and then zeta greater than 1 is called over damped system. And we were, at least I was stuck at the critically damped case in the previous class, so I now know what's the magic trick to solve that, to get the impulse response for critically damped system, so let's try and do that again, so my y of s for the case zeta is equal to 1, y of s is omega n square plus over s plus omega n square. Okay. And then I went back to the table of Laplace transform and I figured that there is this cool uh, result in Laplace transform. So minus, so Ft has the, or F has Laplace transform, capital F, then minus Tf over Ds is equal to Tft. Oh, well, no, uh, is the Laplace transform of TFT. Okay, so this was the result that I was missing in the previous class. And let's do a small detour and try and prove this result, which is pretty straightforward. So the Laplace transform of the function f is integral zero minus to infinity e raised to minus st ft dt okay let's differentiate it with respect to s i get d over ds 0 minus to infinity, e raised to minus ft, e raised to minus st, uh, ft dt. Now, under pretty mild conditions, you can interchange integration with differentiation, okay, particularly because integration is happening with respect to variable t, differentiation is happening with respect to variable s, which is not being integrated here, okay? So I'm going to do that, zero minus to infinity d over ds e raised to minus st ft dt. Which is equal to, well, let me write it in the other board. What's the derivative of e raised to negative st with respect to s? Negative, negative what? One over s. No. No. Negative s. No. 
negative t, okay. e raised to minus st, ft, dt. Uh, so t is being treated as a constant in this expression because your, deri your derivative is only with respect to s, not with respect to t. And s and t are independent variables. So I'm going to treat t as constant. I'm going to take the derivative with respect to s. So that's exactly equal to negative t e raised to negative st ft dt. I'm going to take the negative sign on this side. So I have minus d over ds f of s is equal to 0 minus to infinity e raised to minus st t f t d t. Okay? And this is the Laplace transform. Therefore, minus df over ds is the Laplace transform of tft. Okay, any question? So was this uh, covered in your signals and systems class? Okay. Okay, so this was covered during your signals and systems class. For some reason, I, I've forgotten this formula, but I had some faint remembrance that, uh, that there is some such formula which I could use to prove that the, to get the inverse Laplace transform of this particular transfer function, this particular uh, Laplace transform. Uh, so now I want to apply this for solving, for get, getting the inverse Laplace transform of this particular uh, function. Now I can write, well, I'll do it on this side. I can write omega n square over s plus omega n square as negative d over ds of omega n square over s plus omega n. Okay? Okay, so I have this as result number one. Result number two, I know that the Laplace transform of uh, A over S plus A is A e raised to minus A T. Okay, so this is something I know from Laplace, uh, the Laplace transform table. Okay, so how can I figure out what y of t is going to be? Okay, so I got this from Laplace transform table. I got this from uh, my brain and uh, and now I can, and I got this from the table of properties of Laplace transform. So I want to use these three equations. So let me write this as three to get the value of yt. So let's try and think about it. So I know that this imply, I can take the inverse Laplace transform of this and multiply it by t to get the inverse Laplace transform of this particular uh, function. So what is the inverse Laplace transform of this? So that's omega n square e raised to minus omega n t. And then this one says I just have to multiply this function by t. So let me do that. Multiply it by t. And this is for t greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so that gives me the impulse response of the transfer function there. 
when zeta is equal to 1. <coughs> this was the case that I was stuck in the previous class. So we figured out how to solve that, how to solve this case. Any, any questions on that? Yes. Uh, where did the, you said that, that part um, negative GDS omega n squared over s plus omega n, the part above? This one? No. no. The one right next to it. Where did that come from again? This one? Yeah. From my brain. Yeah, so but like. Um, well, if you do the derivative of this particular uh, function with respect to s, you will exactly get this. Oh, okay. Uh, you will exactly get this uh, function. Okay. Okay. See so where it's backwards? Yeah. Okay. So Emmanuel, that was what was missing in the previous class when you had mentioned it. So you had the correct answer, but we didn't know this. Uh, you didn't refer to this particular result. Okay. All right. So at this point of time, we know the impulse response of this transfer function in all these four cases and in the case of zeta equal to zero the impulse response consists of sinusoidal signal uh, and it continues for infinite time in the damped case it is damped sinusoid which means that the amplitude of sinusoid goes to zero as t goes to infinity in the critically damped case there is no sinusoid whatsoever as you can see it is uh, t, t multiplied by e raised to negative t kind of signal. So it, it goes like this. That's what t e raised to negative omega and t looks like. This is t and this is y of t. Let me multiply it by omega n square. Okay, so it goes up and then it goes down exponentially fast to zero. And the same behavior is observed even for overdamped system, except that it is now a difference of two uh, exponential signals. Okay, but it also goes up and then goes to zero exponent, uh, exponentially fast. So in the handout that I've given to everyone, and hopefully everyone has it, and it's also uploaded on uh, on Carmen, so you should have access to it even if you lose this. Uh, you will see that for various values of zeta, the first figure has the impulse response for a specific value of omega n. So let's assume omega n is equal to 1. So it has normalized the axis with respect to omega n. So let's assume omega n is equal to 1. So then we are looking at time versus response graph. And as you can see, when zeta is small, you have a very, uh, the, the, the amplitude of the sinusoid is pretty high. And then as zeta goes to 1, the amplitude of the sinusoid goes down. And of course, when zeta is equal to 1, there is no sinusoidal wave. It's just, uh, uh, it's just an exponential signal. OK? So that's the impulse response. Today's class, we are going to talk about step response for the same system. And yesterday, we were talking about step response for the second order system in the case of uh, damped oscillation. So let's, uh, let's try and work on that part. Zeta is in zero one, and so my u of s is equal to one over s. So y of s is equal to
okay? We were uh, trying to solve this, we were trying to do the inverse Laplace transform of this transfer function, which looks very intimidating, but uh, partial fraction comes to our rescue. So we write it as A over S plus BS over C, S square plus two zeta omega and S plus omega and square. Uh, so you don't have to write all this down because this is something we did in the previous class. So I'm assuming you can refer to your notes and I can move quickly on the board. 2A zeta omega and S plus A omega and square plus B S square plus C S is equal to omega n square. This implies that A plus B equals to zero. Two A zeta omega n plus C equals to zero at A omega n square equals to omega n square. So we get these three equations and three unknowns. And this is where we stopped in the previous class. This is what we needed to solve. This is the numerator. Okay, so the important thing to note is when you have a second order term in the partial fraction, then you have to have first order term in the numerator. If you have a third order term in the partial fraction, you have to have second order term in the numerator when you are doing uh, the method, when you are applying the method of partial fraction. So there are other ways also to do it. So this is not the only way and I think someone in the class pointed out that uh, after the class that you could use uh, imaginary poles of uh, the denominator to have A, B, and C, uh, three different numerators, all of which would be complex numbers in that case. So in this case, you will get real numbers because of the fact that we took BS plus C in the numerator, okay? Now, what we did was we collected all the S square terms together, all the S terms together, and all the constants together and then we look at the numerator here. So the numerator is only has a constant term. It doesn't have a S square term. It doesn't have an S term. So those terms have to be, those coefficients have to be set to be equal to zero. So I get, so I need now to, uh, I mean, I now, now have to solve for A, B, and C based on these three expressions. So who can tell me what the value of A should be? One. What is the value of B? negative one, what's the value of C? Minus two zeta omega n. Okay, so now I can write my Y of S as one over S plus, oh, one over S minus S over S square plus two zeta n omega n, zeta omega n s plus omega n square minus two zeta omega n over s square plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n square. Okay, I'm going to pause here for questions. Okay, no questions? 
All right, so we started with a step response, looked at the transfer function, did the method of partial fractions, found out the coefficients, got y of s, okay? So now it's, it has terms that we recognize. Uh, so the inverse Laplace transform of one over s is just a unit step. Uh, the inverse Laplace transform of this is, uh, let's look up the table on page 59. Okay, so what we do know from the Laplace transform table is, okay, I need to have some more room. So the inverse Laplace transform of omega n square over s square plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n square is given by omega n over square root one minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega n t multiplied by sine omega dt, where omega dt, where omega d is given by omega n square root one minus zeta square. Okay, so I looked at Laplace transform table to get the Laplace transform of this term here. Okay. I have to erase something. You know, let me, I want to call this, uh, uh, I, I want to give this signal a name. What should I give it? F of, F of t? Uh, let me just call it F of t. Okay, so I'm going, going to give this signal a name, F of t, so that I can, I don't have to copy this whole thing again. Okay, all right, so I know that the inverse Laplace transform of this uh, uh, function is actually f of t, which is given by this uh, long expression. Now I need to find out inverse Laplace transform of y of s, which consists of three different terms, three separate terms. So what's the inverse Laplace transform of the first term, one over s? So it's one. Uh, of course, t is greater than or equal to zero. So this is one. What's the inverse Laplace transform of this term? So I didn't write it on the board, but it can be derived using what's already written on the board. Is that, uh, for that one, is that multiplied by sine of omega dt, that whole thing? This whole thing is multiplied by sine of omega dt, yeah. It's, it's in the same line. Uh, let me write it here. Okay. And I'm going to call this whole signal f of t, okay, this big thing. 
All right, so now I have an S term in the numerator. What do we know about the inverse Laplace transform of S capital FS? Anyone remembers? Sorry? The derivative F prime T. Okay? So, so this is S multiplied by something. So the inverse Laplace transform will be the derivative of the signal itself. But there is one thing missing, which is omega and square. So how do we deal with that? Divide by omega and square. Yeah, multiply and divide by omega and square. So we have one over omega and square f prime t. So what I'm doing is multiplying omega and square and then dividing by omega n square. Okay? And the same trick has to be applied here. So you, we don't have omega n square in the numerator, so I'm going to divide it by omega n square. So I have minus 2 zeta over omega n f of t. And this whole signal is valid for t greater than or equal to 0. For t less than 0, y of t will be equal to 0. OK, so this is the recipe for computing response of a second order system, or for that matter, any order system. You have the transfer function, you get y of s, you do the method of partial fraction, you get, you write the expression for y of s in this particular form, look at the inverse Laplace transform table, or Laplace transform table, and then apply the usual tricks and properties of Laplace transform to get the expression for y of t, okay? Now, of course, there is f prime of t, so we need to differentiate this with respect to t, and there are multiple terms here, so it's going to take quite a bit of time to do it on the board. So I'm just going to write y of t uh, after doing all the calculations. So this is 1 minus 1 over square root 1 minus zeta square e raised to minus zeta omega and t sine of omega dt plus theta, where omega d is omega n square root 1 minus zeta square, and theta is cos inverse zeta. Oh yeah, so this was S over this whole term, right? Now, look at the Laplace table. You have omega n square in the numerator. So I need to have omega n square in the numerator to use Ft. Okay. Okay, so this is the response of a second order system, a step response of a second order system for a damped system, okay? Because the damping factor zeta is between zero and one. <coughs> now let's go back to our handout and see what the response looks like for various values of zeta. So I'm looking at the second figure, step response. So when zeta is equal to 0 0.1, you see a very high overshoot, and then it comes down, and then there is damped oscillation. When zeta is equal to 0 
the peak is much lower. 0 0.4 is even lower. 0 0.7 is very small peak. And then after zeta equals to 1 or higher values, so for critically damped and overdamped system, there is actually no overshoot whatsoever. It just gradually converges to the steady state value. Okay. Okay, so that's what the response is going to look like. Now, if you turn the page and look at the first figure in the back, you will see that for the same value of zeta, which is equal to 0 0.2, high values of omega n apply that you will reach the steady state much sooner. A smaller value of omega n would imply that you will reach steady state at a much later time. Okay. So if you want the system to respond to your inputs extremely fast, you want to ensure through your control design technique that omega n of the overall system of the closed loop transfer function should be as high as possible because only then the system is going to respond very quickly to any input you are going to give it. Okay. Any, any questions on this derivation? I'm going to erase most of it now. Okay. Now, we had studied in one of the previous classes that the step response for second order system has this is my steady state value this is known as rise time tr this is known as peak time tp this is known as percent overshoot or rather it's MP, and then you divide MP by the steady state value to get percent overshoot. And then there is a 2% settling time, TS, which is 2% settling time. Okay, So beyond this, the value, the response is going to be within 2% of the steady state value. So rise time, TR overshoot MP and then peak time TP and then 2% settling time TS. This is my time on this side and y of t on the y-axis. Is there a particular reason why we're concerned with 2% and not 5% or 1%? 2% uh, is just the usual uh, thing that everyone looks at. Uh, but you can, some people look at 5%. It really depends on which uh, industry you are in. Okay. Now this diagram is also the second di diagram on page two. So you will have this diagram with you even if uh, I'm going to erase this particular diagram. Okay. So in order to compute, so rise time is the first time instant at which the response y of t is equal to one. Okay. This is the steady state value. So for the transfer function there, the steady state value is going to be equal to one. But if you have a different value in the numerator, then this value is going to move up and down. So let's just look at the standard transfer function for which the steady state value is 1. Uh, so how do I find TR? Uh, the way to find TR is to set y of TR equals to 1 and then solve for the value of TR.
Oh, so for t getting TR from, oh, the expression is lost, okay. So getting TR from the expression is very difficult because of the exponential term and the sinusoidal term. So you usually do it by looking at the graph. So you will draw the impulse response, the step response of the system on MATLAB, and then you will try and estimate the value of TR by looking at the MATLAB plot, okay? So TR is the first time instant at which Y of TR becomes equal to one. Now peak time, on the other hand, is the time at which the function will achieve its maximum value. So how do you find the maximum value of a function? Derivative equals to zero, right? That's the usual approach. Uh, so use MATLAB to find TR. So at TP, I have Y prime of TP is equal to zero. Okay, again, this is the first time instant at which the derivative of Y with respect to time becomes equal to zero. But it, it's not the only point at which the derivative vanishes. The derivative vanishes here, at this point, at this point, at this point, and so on, right? So in order to make sure well, so derivative vanishes both at maximum and at minimum point, okay? So we have to look at the point at which the derivative is equal to zero for the first time instant, which is going to be the peak time. So if I compute the derivative of y prime t, well, let's compute y prime of t. Uh, that's given by a very long expression So e raised to minus, so I did this derivation at home, so I'm just going to write the expression here. Okay, so this is what the derivative looks like. <coughs> okay, I need to find TP at which Y prime TP is equal to zero. Um, so this term is always going to be positive, okay? Now this is the only term that could go to zero at, at some point of time, okay? Because it's a sine wave, so therefore it can go to zero. But it's not just a sine wave, it is something multiplied by cos plus something multiplied by sine, so that should ring a bell. Okay, uh, let's try to listen to that bell. So I know that theta by definition is cos inverse zeta. So this is cos theta and this is minus sine theta, okay. So what I have is y prime of t equals to something over something minus sine theta cos omega dt plus theta plus cos theta sine omega dt plus theta.
what is this equal to? I want someone to try, someone who is feeling sleepy. <laughs> Okay, so this is sin A cos B minus cos A sin B, right? So sin A cos B minus sin B cos A. What is this equal to? Come on. <laughs> A minus B, okay? All right. This is something that everyone has to remember. It's not part of the syllabus, but you still have to remember it. Okay, so this is sine A minus B, so I'm going to do pattern matching. So this is A, this is B, this is minus sine B, this is cos A. So that should be sine A minus B. So this is something multiplied by sine omega dt plus theta minus theta, okay? And that is equal to sine omega dt. Oh my God, okay. That's a lot of work, by the way, but uh, it's not going to come in the exam. Uh, all right, so I get y prime of t is some positive number multiplied by sine omega dt, okay? Now at time t equals to zero, this is equal to zero, okay? So y prime t is equal to zero. But peak time is the first time after time zero at which the derivative goes to zero. So what's the first time step at which this term is going to go to zero? Pi. Right, so when sine of omega dt is equal to sine of pi, which means tp omega dtp is equal to pi. That's right. So this implies that Tp is equal to pi over omega n square root 1 minus zeta square. <coughs> so then you can modify your peak time based on zeta or omega. That's right. So depending upon what is it that your control variable effect, you can either modify zeta or you can modify omega n and you can change peak time for a second order system. Yes? Uh, for like homework, would you want to just find that by the graph? Uh, for what, peak time? Yeah. This is a closed form expression. Why would you want to use a graph? I think you might need the rise time. So rise time, yes. <coughs> for rise time, you have to use MATLAB because the closed form expression doesn't exist. But for peak time, you have a closed form expression. This is omega and this is zeta. It's part of the problem description. Is this right? the same way for every second order system? For every second order system. Yes. I'm having a bit of trouble figuring out how you got from that first y prime t. Okay, so yeah, okay, good. So this is zeta, Yes. right? By definition, I know that theta is equal to cos inverse zeta, so zeta is equal to cos theta, okay. right? Um, so square root of one minus zeta square is equal to sine theta. And square root one minus zeta square is equal to sine theta. Okay. So this is positive number, it doesn't go to, it, it will never go to zero. This is the only term that will go to zero. I use the trigonometric identity to 
figure out that okay, this is exactly equal to sine of omega dt. So even though it looks very complicated, the final expression is actually pretty simple. The first time at which sine of omega dt is going to be equal to zero is when omega dt is equal to pi. That gives me the expression for tp, which is pi over omega d. And I expanded the term of term omega d here. So that's omega n square root of one minus zeta square. Okay, so omega d, the damped frequency is less than the natural frequency if zeta is between zero and one. All right, so that gives me peak time. Uh, what would the MP, the value of MP be? Uh, oh, everything is out of the board now. Okay, you can go look at the figure two on page number two, and you see the MP overshoot. So my question is, what is the expression for MP? That's right, yeah. Y of Tp minus one. So one is the steady state value. Y of Tp is the response at time Tp. Um, you can compute it again in closed form as e raised to minus zeta pi over one minus zeta square. Over square root of one minus zeta square, okay. Yes. Is the steady state value always normalized to one? So if I put k here, let's say I put uh, omega n square k, you can use the final value theorem to figure out that the steady state value is going to be k, okay? So more generally, uh, do I have time for that? I want to show you how to get the steady state value. Uh, maybe I can, I have two minutes. Uh, I have two minutes, let me do the settling time. I'll get to it in the next class. All right, so this is what my, uh, uh, the, ex the peak is, peak looks like. So the percent overshoot is going to be 100 e raised to minus zeta pi over square root one minus zeta square percent. This is the percent overshoot. This is how much the response is going to overshoot with respect to the steady state value and it's only a function of zeta and nothing else. There's no omega n here, there's no omega d here, it's just zeta, that's it. So by looking at the damping factor, you can, by controlling the damping factor, you can actually control how much peak you are going to see in the response of the system. Okay, now the last thing was 2% settling time, Ts, and that's easy to do. So remember your y of t is given by one minus one over square root of one minus zeta square, e raised to minus zeta omega and t sine of omega dt plus theta. So in order to find 2% settling time, you want to do some sort of approximation, so that's almost satisfies e raised to minus zeta omega n t s is roughly equals to 0 0.02. 
So this is an approximation. This is not exact, but this is an approximation. And this would imply that e raised to that omega and t s is roughly equal to 4. OK, so this is an approximation for 2 percent settling time, but this is exactly what everyone uses. So t s equals to 4 over omega n. OK, that's an approximation. and. That's what we will use for the rest of the semester. Is that always the case? That's general? Generally, for 2 percent settling time, you use 4 over omega n. For 5 percent settling time, you would use 3 over omega n. So we are going to be using 2 percent settling time throughout the course so that there is no confusion. So this is what we are going to use. All right. So that's all for the step response. In the next class, we'll talk about uh, some more. Uh, things about the step response for second order systems.